Ever since you can remember, you felt something in your chest telling you to move, to love, to speak, to try. Day after day, you pretend you don't hear it calling, or maybe you dismiss it as silliness or worse. But it's there, ready for you, and it will wait for you as long as you need. My name is Johnny G, and I invite you to join me on a journey of awakening as we dare to embrace our light. This is Refractive. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Refractive Podcast. I'm Johnny G. Today, I am delighted to introduce you to my guest, Josephine Hardman. She's an intuitive healer, and uh, she started by spending 10 years in academia before she realized that there was something in her pushing her towards a shift. She eventually transitioned into full-time spiritual work, and today, she helps clients primarily in accessing the Akashic records and working through that. She likes to say that she helps clients find the healer within through this spiritual work that she does. So that sounds just like the sweet spot for this podcast. So I know that it's going to be um, it's going to be an amazing episode. She has her own podcast that I invite you to check out. It's called Inner Work, a spiritual growth podcast. You can find it on all of the platforms. And on Instagram, you can reach her at healer.josephine. Welcome, Josephine. It's so nice to have you with us. Oh, thank you so much for the invitation and for that lovely introduction. Absolutely. So I, uh, you know, listeners of Refractive will know that I went through a similar experience to you. Uh, um, while I don't uh, necessarily work with intuitive gifts directly with, uh, with clients, I left my career, which was rather traditional and mainstream, mm -hmm. <clears throat> to pursue a path that was heavily influenced by my spiritual experiences. And it is a super um, exciting, but super uncomfortable process to go through because so many people in our lives can't relate to what's happening. And at best, they can just smile and wish us well. And, yeah. uh, you know, so it, it, it's uncomfortable to go through. And part of the reason that I started this podcast is that I believe that there are a lot of people who feel these nudges inside, that it's time to put aside the life that doesn't fit, the life that fit 10 years ago, um, but that today doesn't quite fit. And to step towards the guidance of your highest inner wisdom and love. Uh, towards a life that feels just right. That's what this is all about. And so the fact that this is an area that you'd like to discuss feels so natural and healthy and perfect. So, you know, would you be willing to kind of walk us through what it was like back then, what mm -hmm. happened, and how it brought you to where you are today? Yeah, I would love to talk about that. And first of all, I think it's so important that you just said that we have to follow that core, deep inner guidance, yeah. which I think comes from the heart mm -hmm. and also from, you know, the divine source, our guides, whoever else is working with us and our own intuition. Because if I go way back, the way I think about this now and the realizations I've had along the way is that really there was a time when I learned this pattern of retreating up into my head. Yeah. And that's how I learned that I could be safe in the world. And because it was uncomfortable to be in the body. Also, I identify as a highly sensitive person, as an empath. So just feeling things so deeply all the time, Yeah, which is how I grew up and how I was a teenager and then into early adulthood. So I learned, oh, okay, I, I'm just going to try to live from the neck up. This was not a conscious thing. I didn't actually say that. <laughs> it just gradually happened um, because it just felt safer up in my head. And also because I realized, oh, through intellectual pursuits, academic endeavors, I can really succeed here. I get rewarded. I get approval. I get love, quote unquote. Yes. So that felt really good. And safe and it's, rewarding yes it's kind of like it's kind of like 
um, in, a, in a laboratory, like the animals that push a button and get the food, <laughs> right? It's like, okay, yeah, I can just push this button all day long and I get everything I need, right? Everything I think I need. It's perfect. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So it really feels like it's working while we're in it, right? Yeah. At least in the beginning. So eventually I learned that pattern so well that I, you know, I went to college, really excelled there, graduated with a 4.0, like all the stuff. I was always the just an A student and people pleaser and all of that stuff. Um, and then I went straight into grad school. I didn't take a break, which probably looking back, you know, I didn't feel like I needed a break, but probably if I had taken a break, maybe there would have been more reflection, <laughs> but it just felt like the momentum was there. So I just kept going. So I went into grad school. I got my master's. I got my PhD in English literature. And the plan for very long, for a very long time was, okay, I'm going to be a tenured professor um, and that's what I'm working towards and I'm jumping through all the hoops and I'm making everything happen as expected. And as I was doing that, still, I was getting a lot of approval, rewards, um, scholarships, funding, like even material benefits, which is difficult. That's difficult stuff to walk away from. But anyway, I started feeling like there's something missing here. Where first of all, the environment of academia itself, which I started feeling like this is too competitive. For me, I don't want to live a life where I have to be constantly jumping through hoops based on other people's expectations yes. of what I have to be accomplishing next because it's all pretty clearly defined predetermined like these are the things you do to get to be a tenured professor and if you don't do them you don't get there so it's not this like unique path you know where you can be totally yourself really yeah. um so that started feeling very constricting and i started to feel in my heart there's just something missing here and probably also I started to feel in my body the repercussions of existing only from the neck oh, yeah. up because my body started saying, hey, this is not working in a lot of different ways. What, um, what would that be like if I could jump in? Like, let's say, yeah. you know, and certainly there may be some sensitive areas that you might not uh, want to go into, but oh, no, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm happy to share. <laughs> for a listener who may not realize that their body is shouting like, yes. hey, this isn't working because you're not following your authentic path. Like, what does that yeah. even look like? Oh, yeah. So for me, and of course, it's going to be individual to each person. But for me, I can identify probably two different things that really stand out. One is that I started feeling, you know, as I was completing my PhD coursework and attending my graduate seminars, first of all, I didn't want to go anymore <laughs> so it was like dreading having to go into the two and a half hour seminars where we were talking about 17th century english literature which is what i wrote my dissertation on and you know i loved it at the time i mean i still love literature but i felt like some of the things we were talking about had nothing to do with the real world yeah so i started kind of like escaping from my body or like there was a part of me that was hovering above me looking down and saying to me what what does this mean is this meaningful enough what are you doing here maybe there's another place where you are needed more than in this classroom like talking about this stuff yeah um so i started to feel almost like that dissociation or that my higher self was hovering above and so some questioning started to happen which you know i just try to suppress that mm -hmm. eat sugar binge on netflix don't mm -hmm. don't think about it yeah. <laughs> because it was really like oh if i if i really ask these questions maybe the answers are going to lead me to a totally different right. place and what, yes. what the hell do I do with that? What does it mean? Yeah, if I've already yeah. done all this work. I can't just like, wait, I can't just like turn left right now. Exactly. But when you said that this dissociation, was that kind of in the form of almost like daydreaming? Like what, how did it feel? Yeah, it felt like daydreaming. It felt like, I mean, again, I wasn't fully in my body. And it was like, I could see myself from outside of myself 
doing all the actions, taking all the steps to finish my PhD, do all the things, but it just started to feel kind of robotic. Yeah. And like, is this really where you want to be? So yeah, it just felt almost like there was a split, like an internal split yeah. or something, you know, with the part of me that already had built this identity and was thinking, well, we better keep going because I want the benefits. I want the salary. I want the prestige. Right. I want the recognition. I don't want to upset or disappoint anyone. I mean, all the narratives yeah. that come up yeah. with that mm -hmm. and the attachments. And then the other part of me, my heart, my higher self that was saying, wait, maybe you're supposed to be somewhere else. So that was one thing. But then also my body started speaking to me physically. So I had a, a number of different, I mean, accidents. They're not really accidents, but I injured my knee while I was walking on campus. <laughs> um, and then I had knee pain for a long time after that, which now looking back, I know was just the way that my body was trying to communicate with me. And then I started getting sick a lot. So I had laryngitis recurrently. I had strep throat. I couldn't speak. It was like I was losing my voice. Yeah. Which again is really symbolic. Um, so yeah, there was just a lot happening. Yeah. As the as the truthfulness of where I want where I really wanted to be or needed to be, that was coming to the surface. So right. yeah, there was a lot. And so for listeners who may not resonate with the idea that your body is tripping itself or whatever uh, in a, as a way to warn you about a, a, a spiritual or a life path, you know, yeah. I think there's another way to look at it, right? There's, there's, there's um, the idea that because it, because you're not doing what feels refreshing and energizing, um, it, it takes more energy, right? Mm -hmm. And so because it takes more energy, it drains you. And yeah. over time, as you are drained, you, your immune system becomes weaker your yeah. awareness becomes uh, diminished, right? And so yeah. there's, you know, you, you we can look at it in a way that I do and that you seem to, where like, this is really my, my, my physical body communicating with my emotional body, communicating with my spiritual body. But if you want to look at it from a physical level as well, it also really makes sense. Yeah, yeah, the, the body will break down yeah. because you can't sustain that level of, I mean, you're exerting so much energy right. doing something that's not aligned. Right. And as, exactly as you're saying, if it's almost like your life force itself gets drained. And yeah. then, yeah, you are going to have more accidents. You're going to trip. You're going to get sick yeah. if there's a flu going around. Yeah. So, yeah, it's many different levels that go into that. Yeah. Thank you for letting me kind of detour us into that. So, okay. So this is how it felt in your body when... Uh, when these kind of red flags are going up of, wait, I'm, I'm not exactly on the right path. So what was next? Yeah. Well, and I also should backtrack a little bit and say, because my whole life, I really, first of all, I grew up in a spir very spiritual home. My mom is a psychotherapist, also a healer. My dad was a high school teacher. Now he's a professor, but also a very spiritual person. So Growing up, I was exposed to yoga, meditation, mindfulness, the Akashic records, the tarot, all of these things. And it was just really open. It was like a natural part of the household. And so I always had this active spiritual life that was running in parallel to my academic, very heady intellectual experiences. Um, and my spiritual life was always a great place of solace and comfort for me so I would turn to that when I felt like oh the questioning is coming up or I don't know what the next step is and I would just use that and I use that in a lot of ways to heal myself really and then I started getting trained in healing modalities for myself first at the time not knowing oh maybe I'm going to use this in the future to be of service to others um, but so I learned about Reiki, I learned about um, psychosynthesis, which is coaching modality. Then I became certified in the Akashic Records for myself. So all of that was still going on in parallel. And then I started feeling more and more of a pull towards that side of things. And then I started thinking, well, what if this could actually be 
instead of like a little side hobby or something that I do on the side, what if that's really what I'm being called right. to make the bigger part of my life right. and to be of service for other people? Mm-hmm. So I already had a lot of those tools. And then that's when I started realizing in a very organic, gradual way, oh, right, yeah, I'm supposed to hold space for others, as we say, yeah. um, and just be of service in this deeper spiritual really profound way so because i already had a lot of the certifications i one point i just decided okay i'm going to finish my phd because i've done so much work i'm so close it's just to give that closure to follow through which is really important to me um so i did finish and then i took the summer off and then i started my spiritual business so i started building it from the ground up like the same year that I finished my PhD. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so, um, all right. So in this journey, you um, were per- pursuing this path to a tenured professor. And part of that was uh, earning your PhD. And mm-hmm. it's like, as soon as you get this PhD, that kind of yeah. opens the door to the path that you had been pushing towards, um, yeah. You're like, you know what? We don't need that yeah. anymore. <laughs> yeah. I know. And I thought about, you know, I thought, okay, do I go in the job market, right? Because as you're finishing your last few semesters, you start to get all your materials together to go on the academic job market, yeah. which is a nightmare, by the way. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's a lot I could say about that, but I won't. But it's like a really draining, anxiety producing, stressful experience <laughs> for people. And most people do not get the job that they want. Yeah. And then they have to be an adjunct, which is a whole other problem. But anyway, so I thought, okay, do I go on the job market anyway and see what happens? And but then I just realized there's really no point in that like I'm just not gonna that's not where I want to be um so instead I just celebrated myself for completing the PhD and then just rested the whole summer and then started my business (laughs) yeah which I yeah some people were like what Mm -hmm. (laughs) but that's just what I had to do a really wise friend of mine uh said uh in reference to another person that we both knew who um felt guided to uh, make a major life change. I'll just, yeah. just to keep it simple, I'll say that. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this wise person said, when you step in to follow your highest path, right? The universe uh, kind of supports it. Yep. And you know, this is referenced by a, a, a quote from the alchemist. Uh, by Paolo Coelho, which is when you pursue your personal legend, the universe conspires in your favor, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, However, he said, once you kind of lay these first few bricks, then comes the loving attempt by the universe to make sure what you're doing is what you really want. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> and like, and like, they're gonna make it, the universe is gonna make you work for it. It's not just this ordained slide down a slide. No. It is, um, <laughs> you know, it's easy to get up to the slide and it's easy yeah. to get to the edge of the slide, but uh, it's not going, it's not effortless just because it's been, just because it's been ordained by the universe. So tell yeah. me about those bumps that you found where the universe really made you prove that you wanted it yeah that's so good um yeah it's now I can have a retrospective understand or you know looking back at the years I've been doing my spiritual business versus all of the years I was in grad school and teaching college and now I can see how that was a lot easier because everything was predetermined and I knew what was expected of me and I knew what the criteria was for success. So I could be my full perfectionist self and that really served me well there. But building a business from the ground up is not like that at all. At least my experience of it, there is no roadmap. You can't 
I mean, if you're trying to imitate or copy what someone else has done, it's just not gonna work. So for me, the bumps have been, and I now I realize how making that shift and starting my own business was really almost like jumping into this accelerated healing incubator where all of my stuff just comes up to the surface all of the time or a lot of the time because I've hit up against my perfectionism, for example, or which is so counter to being a successful entrepreneur where you have to be experimental and you have to be curious and you have to make mistakes. You have to allow yourself to make mistakes and you have to redefine what it means to be successful or what a what failure means because there really is no failure you just try things and then gather the data and then see how you proceed from there so in having to adopt that more experimental mindset and that mindset of okay sometimes i'm going to try something and it's going to feel like i'm falling flat on my face and i'm failing and nobody cares about what i'm doing <laughs> and they're not interested and I feel like an idiot and yet the next day I'm gonna get up and yeah. try something else or do it again because yeah. you just have to keep showing up over and over and over again so I think that's real. that has been the biggest thing or this it's almost like a divine requirement of showing up over and over and over again consistently mm -hmm. no matter what has happened the day before and not having that attachment to having to get everything perfect yeah which for me has been huge um and also of course you know so there's been bumps just more logistically in terms of oh i try to launch this course or offer the service and then oh okay that's not actually what people need or want so i have to <laughs> Google and redesign it and check back in with my guides and see what actually wants to come through. So, the, and that's just a continual learning and growth yeah. process. Yeah. yeah. You know, does it, that make sense? It, yeah, of course. Yeah. And, you know, I, when, when we started talking, uh, this thought that arose was it's so, uh, what a dramatic shift to go from academia where yeah. every, we only deal in what is known yeah, um, right. to a spiritual path where <clears throat> we only, pardon me, <clears throat> where we only deal in what is yeah. believed, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 and believe through feelings, believe through experience, believe through intuition, whatever the case yeah. is. And it's like, on one hand, they seem so polar, yet... Yeah. Yet I see a really beautiful correlation in what you're just describing with the scientific method, right? That's because true. if you're in a laboratory, there's no such thing as failure. If, if, if you don't get the result you expected from the experiment, that is as valuable and as successful as if you got the, 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 the result you wanted. And it might even be more valuable, or, you know? Yeah. Whereas we, um, we, the sensitive, fragile, emotionally needy, beautifully perfect beings that we are, yeah. um, you know, we have to show up, we have to try. Uh, and then sometimes we get the result we, we expected. Sometimes we get the result we, we don't. Yet, yeah. unlike the scientist who has an upper hand in this viewpoint, we are like, it's over. It's over. My it's over. <laughs> it's time for a new incarnation. Just take me. It's over. Yeah. It's over. You yeah. know, and so it's so fascinating to see how, you know, we can often look at science and say, yeah, science, that's cute. We're dealing in something bigger. We're dealing in, you know, in, in, in all. And yet, you know what? There's some things to learn on both sides. Yeah. That's such a great point because it is like that scientific method and there's so much we learn when we try something and then we don't get the expected result yeah and something different happens but sometimes that's where the magic happens sometimes that we're, that's where a doorway opens so we have to follow those yeah. threads yeah. that's so important but then another thing i'm thinking of now which we were briefly chatting about earlier which is you know you get on your spiritual path 
or your path of just being true to yourself. That's right. Which doesn't have to be spiritual necessarily. Um, and sometimes it feels in the beginning like, well, first of all, there is a kind of euphoria, right? When you first set out on that path and the sense of, oh, now there are expanded possibilities. Now I am free. Now I'm gonna do exactly what is authentic to me. And that's all wonderful and great. Although sometimes it can also be destabilizing because we're like, what, who am I now? What am I, where am I living? What am I gonna do? Um, but then a lot, then we have to stay on the path. And as the path unfolds, it's not always, there's not always a high. We're not always at a peak, having a peak experience. Sometimes we're just in that neutral space as you were saying before. And I think, for so many of us, we also have to learn that there are a lot of moments in life that are, or most moments in life are neutral yeah. or just that there's quiet and not a lot is happening. I think because of our culture and society and the fast pace, speed and just everything happening always faster and faster. And we're trying to accumulate more and more and technology keeps developing. And it's almost like the sense that we've lost the connection to our inner rhythms yes. and to the rhythms of nature and to that rhythm, which does have some peaks, but then there's valleys and then there's just those flat places. And I think it's so important that we learn how not to try to escape from those moments or to use substances, experiences, other people, chaos, drama, whatever, just to have more of the fireworks. Right. Yes. <laughs> um, and to just embrace those moments of stillness yeah. where not a lot is happening as well. Because mm -hmm. sometimes those are the moments where we receive the clearest guidance about what the next step might be. So it's just so important not to fill them up with stuff. Yeah. If that makes sense. I yeah. think that's really valuable. You know. Last night, I was talking with a close friend of mine, and I was saying how, listen, I left my career. I have not had an address in almost a year now, wow. right? Um, I, I own about 10 boxes of things. That's all. I, I don't have <laughs> anything left, right? Um, you know, and it's like, there's this, there's this part of me that says, look, uh, God, source, universe, whatever, like I've done my part. Like I, I, I did the crazy that you asked me to do, <clears throat> you know, and I started this podcast. Um, I started coaching. I did all of this and I had great momentum at the beginning. My numbers were growing at the beginning and all of this. And then like, you know, I, I put my skin in the game, right? I put my butt on the line and I took these leaps with nothing behind my back, but some internal nudging. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I want some prizes, right? I want yes. some prizes. <laughs> I want podcast growth. I want, um, yeah. I want my business to take off. I want more important than those things, although those things really matter to me too, but more important to those things, I want to wake up in the morning like Snow White <laughs> with the birds yeah. helping me get dressed. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I want, I want, uh, I want the world to visibly and noticeably like gather its forces yeah. around me and like hug me all the time yeah. and say, good, good boy, good, good yeah. boy. You are mm -hmm. doing it, you're doing it, you're doing it. It's so good. And I gotta tell you, Josephine, like that doesn't happen. Yeah. Almost all the time, the best I get is neutrality, like you just mentioned. Yeah. And um, in our society, neutrality feels like a loss. Oh, it feels like emptiness. Yes. Right? It feels and you want to fill empty. it with something. Yeah. It feels empty. And I don't want to feel empty. Like my ego, like I want to feel 
energized and refreshed all the time because yes. I had the courage to follow my faith or right. the insanity to follow my faith. How yeah. do you want to look at it? Yeah, and, both, yeah. you know, and I don't have that. And it sounds like you have had moments of this too. And like, what do you, like, what can we even say about this? Yeah, well, I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is to, the importance of asking what part of you is the part that is longing for that, whatever it is, the approval, the recognition, the metrics, right, to grow. Well, darn, Josephine, warn me before you stab me. I mean, <laughs> I'm so, I'm sorry. I just well, been attacked. No, yeah, and I'm saying it because that's, um, that's something that I've learned that's very important to me and how I run my business if I'll, before taking an action yeah. or if I feel I'm having a triggering, a triggered response to something is to sit and center myself and ask, okay, from what part of me am I operating right now? Because I have moments where I operate my business from my eight-year-old little girl self who wants to send out an email campaign as though it's an invitation to my birthday party and I want everyone to come because if, if people don't come then I'm an idiot and I'm wow. not loved and I'm gonna feel like a failure and I'm gonna feel rejected right so the fear of rejection is in there too um so I have and then that will paralyze me yeah right so I have to ask okay from what part of myself do I actually want to run by my business in this moment? Or what's the part that has the attachment to everyone coming to the party? What does that actually mean? Yeah. Um, and is it okay to take the risk of sending out the email campaign mm -hmm. anyway and seeing what happens? Right. And then of course, I think we can have bigger attachments, right? So to the approval or to being loved or to getting the respect or the recognition but like you said, that's the ego getting in the way somewhere in there or a part that felt unloved growing up um, or a part that wants the constant excitement and feels really scared to face that void of the emptiness that feels like death almost sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so really about working with those different parts, I think is can be super helpful and important yeah. just to be more mindful of that. I agree. I think, you know, what, you know, understanding your motivations uh, yeah. is so key. And this is why so many coaches do values work with people, right? Like, what are your values? What are your drivers? And like, let's embrace the, let's embrace the nastiness of it. And let's embrace, yeah. you know, like, Hey, if achievement or if competition is a value, let's yes. just roll in it like a, like of a pig, course. you know. Yeah. Let's just a, you know, let's leave the story that we're being greedy by by because we're naturally competitive. Like let's like roll around in it and and yeah. and see what's what. Where's the love in that too? You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Wait. Can I say something yes. about that? That's so, also so important, and I think specifically on the spiritual path, sometimes people can have this misconception or this idea of like, I have to release all the attachments, all the desires. I have to be able to just sit here quietly with myself and just be at peace at all times, mm -hmm. which maybe is like asking a lot of ourselves and kind of unrealistic because we still have human bodies and we're having a human experience. And I think that having desires, wanting more for ourselves, being ambitious, like all of that can be part of the human experience. It's not wrong or bad or unspiritual or greedy to want more. And sometimes I think there are some people probably like, sounds like you're one of them, I'm one of them, that we just want bigger things for ourselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all of the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I don't know if it is we're type A or ambitious or whatever it is, or if we just have big desires that divine source is calling us forth to fulfill those desires yeah. um and so sometimes i think that's why the moments of stillness can feel uncomfortable because we want more and we want bigger yeah. but i again i don't think that that means that we're being greedy or wrong right. or selfish yes. for wanting that so we can embrace that and then 
work towards it. I, yeah, I think that's totally fine. This is such a liberating, this is such a liberating um, concept that <clears throat> because um, I have come to believe mm -hmm. that, um, okay, so for all of my qualities, for each quality that I have, mm -hmm. uh, there, the quality lies on a continuum. Mm -hmm. And on one side of the continuum is the self-serving side of the quality. And on mm -hmm. the other side of the mm -hmm. continuum is the other serving side of the quality. Now, I believe that all is one, right? I believe that all is one. So therefore, is there really a difference between serving the self and serving others? That's a philosophical conversation we don't have time yeah. for today, uh -huh. you know? <laughs> but the point of that, the point of me bringing that up is that <clears throat> in order for me to serve the, the world in the way yeah. that I feel guided to, um, I need to want to have a successful podcast. Right. Do you know what exactly. I mean? So the way yeah. I look at it, I could look at it as being selfish and say, mm -hmm. oh yeah, well, like I want to be so ego validated by having this yeah. big podcast. But the fact is, the fact that I naturally strive towards this is a gift from the universe because yeah. imagine I was called to do this and hated it. Imagine oh, I was called to do this and I was painfully shy to talk to strangers. Oh, like right. how difficult would that be? Yeah. You know, yeah. so there's a way to look at this as the universe is using my characteristics, yeah. which is I like being in the spotlight. Yeah. I like having a lot of attention and right. it's using that to say, all right, let's funnel this into this way. And yeah. Yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, we still need to look for the middle path of that, of that uh, characteristic, but um, it's, it, it's, it's incomplete, in my opinion, to see my desire for validation or my desire for achievement or my desire for financial comfort as yeah. a negative, because right. it is a tool that the universe leverages to help me accomplish service uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in an important way. Yes, that's such a good point. I think you're also talking about like, because I think if you have a what I call a clean motivation for something, so a clean motivation for your podcast to grow, and I have the same motivation because I have a podcast too. Um, and of course, again, we are spiritual, but also human beings. So we're going to have the higher spiritual goal of, I want to be of service. I want to reach as many people as possible to help them free themselves from suffering, to be authentic. So they feel heard and seen and understood all of the stuff. And as a human, I also want to have nice things and a nice house. And I want people to like me. <laughs> Like there's just no getting around that because if we try to suppress it, I think it just gets stronger yeah. or it can be, it can almost like taint the motivation or corrupt it. So just being aware of all of those things that are floating around in there of why we want something, yeah. but that there always can be a higher purpose to it. And if we align with that higher purpose, then we're going to be that much more successful in getting there. So that's right. That's right. Yeah. So shifting a little bit, um, mm -hmm. Josephine, if you, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what, um, how you help people find their inner healer and activate their inner healer? Uh, you know, there may be, uh, I've talked on uh, some earlier episodes about the Akashic Records, but never in depth. So I wonder okay. if you could give us like a gentle overview of, you know, um, how you help people heal and what are some of those tools and modalities you use? Um, because I think I think it might be valuable, uh, and and it could give listeners inspiration to go do some research on this. Oh, thing. definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So first, um, well, I should start by saying typically um, the clients, the people that are drawn to me, are people that have been on the spiritual path for a while. And who, so maybe at some point, you know, they feel like they've had an awakening, whether it's been gradual or like through a, through a sudden catalyst or something happening. 
And so they have some experience with doing inner work or they've already explored some modalities, but really I think the key thread for all of them at the end of the day is that they're, so they've been on the path for a while, but they're hitting up against something bigger that's emerging to be healed or they're discovering, oh, I'm hitting up against this recurrent pattern over and over again, and I don't know how to shift it, or I'm so sick and tired of being in this place. Um, and also I think they're discovering that there's no one outside of themselves that's gonna save, rescue, or fix them, or heal them. And so they're in that, kind of like in the midst of taking the power back from yeah. wherever they've given it away to other people, to patterns, to even substances or compulsive behaviors, wherever, or even to other spiritual teachers, because sometimes we give our power away there too. Um, so that's typically where they are. And then the Akashic records are such a um, appropriate and helpful modality for people when they are in that place, because the, re well, First of all, I should say the Akashic Records are a vast archive of information that includes information about every single time that a person has incarnated into a physical body. So it's almost like when your soul is first sparked into existence, that's when your record is first created. So people have individual records inside of the Akashic Records. And so there is information there about past life, experiences unresolved past life trauma also if we've made past life contracts or vows like for example a contract of i'm never going to use my intuition again because in the past that has made me suffer or i was killed rejected banished for using my gifts whatever the story might be um and then the records are also really really good for exploring questions about purpose in the current lifetime. So what am I here to do? How am I here to serve? How can I embody my soul purpose at its highest level? How can I take my power back? All of those kinds of questions. So we can go into the records um, to explore all of that and then to revoke the past life contracts and vows that are not helpful anymore. And also to explore if we have unconscious agreements with people in this lifetime or family members because sometimes we have agreements on an unconscious level for example of I will never make more money than my father for whatever reason or I will never outshine my sister or my mother because that's how I stay safe and I need to be behind the scenes I need to be in the background yeah um so I work through a lot of things like that um, and also just shifting patterns that are really strong or recurrent or dysfunctional and helping people. Well, a lot of what we've been talking about today about the different parts that we have within ourselves. So for that, I use more psychosynthesis, which is a modality about bringing integration to all those parts um, and really just harmony so they can work together instead of always having this inner conflict yeah. that's happening where one part wants the material success and the other part is like no that's not spiritual so there's like self-sabotage yeah. that is created so really in working to harmonize those parts mm -hmm. so that then the person at their highest level can take steps forward to create the life that they want to create okay all right yeah and so you know from this human perspective, we look at the concept of healing and it's almost like when we go, uh, we want to um, start a healing process mm -hmm. and then get a certificate at the end and say, OK, you're healed, yeah. you know. And so mm -hmm. um, what does healing really look like? I mean, if if yeah. someone let's say if someone has, you know, crippling self-worth um, uh, challenges and they come to you for healing on that. Like, what does the healing manifest as? How does it take um, form? What's the proof that there is healing in their life? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think that's another of the, sometimes that we have expectations 
about that that we can really get in the way of the healing yeah. or just get in trouble with that um because well the way i see it heal healing is not linear it's on a spiral and there are deeper layers of healing that can come up even as we think oh i've already done this thing i've already healed this thing never going to deal with it again and then it resurfaces and there can be anger there can be disappointment there can be oh i didn't do it right there can be shame involved. There's a lot, like a lot of mixed emotions that can come up when that happens. So just really remembering that it's on a spiral. And if it's coming up again, then it's coming up in a different way because you're still moving forward. So it's coming up in a different or a deeper way to be looked at again. Mm -hmm. So for self-worth specifically, well, there's a lot of different ways I could look at that based on the person's individual story but for example we might go into the records to ask something like first I would start with are the self-worth issues something that are limited to this one lifetime or is this bigger mm -hmm. than this lifetime because if the person is carrying those patterns or those wounds from a from prior lifetimes then we might want to go into what were those past life experiences where the issue originates that can be a really important thing to look at in the records um and what is the trauma associated with that and then what are the unconscious contracts that maybe this person made as a result of the trauma to keep themselves safe now and so often with self-worth issues ultimately when it comes down to it what we discover is that at some point on some level it's almost like the person made a contract or an unconscious agreement of convincing themselves in of the story that they're not worthy yeah for whatever reason like however that played out in their upbringing or a past life uh, and now they're just continually convincing themselves yeah. of the same story so at that point, it really becomes about looking at the story and then seeing how we can release it, shift it, what's a more empowering story that they can tell. Um, and I think it's also important, you know, because sometimes we're working in the records and it's really abstract or really high spiritual realms, but also bringing it down to the body. So like making it safe, even at a nervous system level, like what does it feel to be worthy or to feel worthy? Does it feel safe mm. to feel worthy and to be worthy in the world and to yeah. carry yourself in that way? Or does it not, does, does it feel like you're going to die if you do that? Or other people are going to be mad, disappointed, whatever. Um, so even bringing in the, the body level or somatic level of making it really safe and okay mm -hmm. to believe that we are worthy. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. So I imagine some people have a more dramatic leap in their healing, right? They're able to see that they don't need to keep carrying a particular part of a story forward. And then there's like, yeah. a, there's, there's, there's a quantum jump there. And then for others, it might be more like a sunrise where like the sun yeah. keeps rising, but you can't really see it move, but you can like, you know, if you come back five minutes later, you can see there's been progress over time. Yeah, that's exactly right. And again, we can never tell in advance or say in advance how that's going to happen for people. So I think letting go of rigid expectations yeah. is really important. Seeing the healing as a spiral um, and also having the awareness that sometimes there are parts of us that don't want to heal or that want to hold on to the old story because it's become some kind of safety blanket. Yeah. And maybe that's just how we learned. This is how I'm going to be safe in the world and okay in the world. And if I let go of this identity, then what? Right. Like sometimes the unknown can be a lot scarier yeah. than staying in discomfort, the present discomfort, which is already known. Um, so I also work on that a lot too, kind of figuring out what is the secondary gain of the self-limiting story. Because if there wasn't a secondary gain or some benefit that we're deriving from it, we just wouldn't have it in the first place. Yeah. So really working with that too, to avoid sabotage in the healing process down the line. Oh, 
thank you for your service. It's really, it's beautiful oh. to, to just be able to observe people, uh, you know, using their gifts to, uh, you know, help others. It's, 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 it's inspiring. Yeah. Oh, it's my honor. I mean, I'm so blessed every day that I get to do this, even in the moments where I'm like, ah, the podcast is not big enough. Yet. <laughs> or whatever it might be happening, right? <laughs> That's right. So yeah. if people want to learn more about you, what you do, how to get in touch with you or, or, or to examine some of your services, how can they do that? Yeah, so they can go on the website, which is really simple, josephinehartman.com. Mm -hmm. And if they want, I would invite them to sign up for my newsletter. They will get um, my spiritual hygiene routine. So it's yeah. for different spiritual practices, mm -hmm. um, really to ground ourselves throughout the day, but to stay connected also to the divine, to create more stillness, all of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also on Instagram as you mentioned, where I do, every month I do free uh, tarot challenges. Yeah. So people who want to explore the tarot or connect more to their cards or learn how to read intuitively, mm -hmm. I do that every single month. Mm -hmm. So there's a great community on there. Um, and then of course the podcast, which is Inner Work, a spiritual growth podcast mm -hmm. on all the platforms. And what's your Instagram handle one more time? Oh yeah, that's at healer.josephine. Okay, very good. Yeah. And then for those who are not on YouTube, but who are listening uh, on a podcast, uh, 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 on an audio uh, platform, um, Josephine is with a PH and Hardman is with a D, H-A-R-D-M-A-N. Yeah, thank oh, you for absolutely. clarifying. Yeah, that's important. Josephine, thank you so much for joining us today. It was really a lovely, uplifting, uh, delightful conversation. And it, I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, that was so great. I love everything that we talked about. So thank you so much. And I hope this is helpful to someone. Absolutely. Everyone, thank you for listening to Refractive. And as you go out and meet people in the world, realize that everybody's just doing the best they can. No one would ever hurt another person if they weren't confused. So don't forget to aim your light. Take care. You have been listening to Refractive Podcast and this is Johnny G. If you've enjoyed today's episode, do me a favor, give it a share on social media or if you're in the podcast app, give it a rating. If you're on YouTube, click like. It really does make a difference in the search results. I am a speaker, coach, and facilitator based in Washington, D.C., but I work in person and remotely with people who are ready to step with clarity into their most authentic life. If I can be of service, reach out to me, Johnny, J-O-H-N-N-Y, at refractivecoaching.com. Have an amazing day. Be good to each other. And always remember, aim your light. <laughs>